Can everyone hear me? Love the thumbs up in the back. Everyone, you guys can hear me. Awesome. All right, we're going to get started. Um, definitely go ahead and keep eating and everything, but we do have a lot of announcements to go through. Um, hey, everyone. Welcome. It's our third month back to in person. Uh, we will be hearing soon about the Midtown CVTSP project, but before we move to the program, let me get a number of items and announcements out to you guys. We only have a few more, few more months in 2021. The board and the committee chairs are still just pushing through, guys, and, and everything. So it's been a, you know, we've made it a great year. Thank you all for helping us make it a great year, and we're going to continue. Our service committee chairs, Keith Rowling and Dino, with the help of our members, hit it out of the park with that backpack drive. Thank you all so much. I'm going to have some more numbers on that, hopefully at the annual meeting, just so you guys can hear a little bit more of how you helped us hit it out of the park because it, it was amazing. It was well above our expectation of what we were thinking was going to happen. But um, we're continuing to get thank yous from the organizations because a lot of kids, you guys helped a lot of kids get back into school with a backpack on their back, you know, and some, some supplies. So there's some pictures and everything. Y'all probably can go to the website and check it out. But it, it was it was a really, really cool thing. Our programs committee, which includes Whitney, Tom, and Emily, are working to finalize the details for the rest of the year. September is our annual meeting. I'll get back to that. Be on the lookout for October meeting. It's a joint meeting with the Georgia ITE organization, and it'll be celebrating the TMC's 25th anniversary. So that's going to that's gonna be awesome. Be ready. On the lookout for that. November, we're bringing back our, our awards banquet. We took a year off last year for obvious reasons. We're bringing that back. While I'm talking about that, um, the awards nominations are open, and they will be open through September 31st. Um, so there's six categories you can go and look at, and you can nominate your own organization or project you work on, some other organization or project that you think was really cool. Please go nominate, and this will be not only for this year, but since we missed last year's awards, Look, look at some of the projects that were going on even last year, you know, that was being done during COVID and stuff. So just get those nominations in. That's really important. We, I'm not going to lie, guys. We do have a hard time getting nominations in for awards. So would love just a push from all of you guys to, to get them in there so we can have something to review and get you guys some plaques out there. Um, Rachel Cohen, our networking chair, she's working on a beautiful thing for the annual meeting. Great food, all kinds of fun stuff, ready to go. Now, is that too much pressure, Rachel? Oh, okay, sorry. I've just heard it's great food, so hey. <laughs> the food will be great. That's all that, I mean, that's all that matters. All right, our 2021 annual meeting chair, Ty Alexander with AECOM, is working um, with his team, obviously constantly on the final details of our annual meeting since it is, coming up uh, on September 19th to the 21st. Registration and sponsorship is open. Golf registration for Sunday is open. So as of right now, we have 100 people registered for this annual meeting, 100 people. So this is quite, I'm, I'm actually pretty excited. I know there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, I'm sure it's affecting all of us as it is myself too. So if y'all do have any questions, comments, or concerns, definitely contact me or Ty or Anyone on the board, you know, we'll help you work through that. We do have one foursome for golf on Sunday. <laughs> so I, I just wanted to say golf registration is open. That is an outdoor activity, so uh, keep that in mind. Our cutoff date for the block rate on hotel rooms is today. So there, after today, they will open up our blocked, and you won't get the, the good pricing and things like that with the room rates and stuff like that. So please um, take that into consideration and reserve your hotel room. All right, so basically Savannah, Georgia, September 19th to the 21st with the theme of On the Road Again. So I look forward to you. The technical program is complete, ready to go, and it's also on our website if you want to look at that. All right, looking out to 2022, 
ITS Georgia as, as our lead conference chair with Mike Holt. He's our fearless leader moving that forward. Planning with the Southeastern ITS Summit. It's going to be next November 2022. This will be a regional conference with ITS Florida, ITS South Carolina, ITS Tennessee, and GRITS. That's bringing together eight states to showcase innovative ITS projects and products, and that will be here locally in Atlanta. So next November 20, 2022. Brooke Martin and Stephen Sheffield have done a phenomenal job this year on our membership committee. We have reached our goal. Our goal pre-COVID was over 100. Obviously, our membership has declined given um, what's been going on in the world. But we set a goal of 80 members this year, bringing it up a little bit from last year um, with what we dealt with. And we, we fit that goal. So I just, I really thank them for their efforts of trying to get some of our organizations back involved and just supporting our organization because we can't do it without our memberships and sponsorships. Next on the list, all right, we're going to talk about elections committee. I'm Winter Horrible for people who don't know me. I, I work for Temple Incorporated. I've been the president last year and this year. It's been a crazy couple of years doing the president stuff with what's been going on um, but we are having elections and this will be for officers and four board members the elections have been open since last month's meeting and they will close next Tuesday on August 31st there are a few people I've got the list of people who have not voted so you may be getting a call from me because we're going to try to get our voting up and it could be that the email went into spam could be that you just somehow the email got even blocked before it hit your spam. So if you don't, if you're not sure if your organization has voted and you just are wondering who that, because there is one voting person per organization. Um, so if you just need to know who that is, y'all can get in touch with me. But I will be making some phone calls um, over the next week just trying to help get that up. Um, but basically, and we're going to get to hear from a few more people. We got to hear from some people last month. We've got a few people who would like to come up here. So if y'all just want to walk over here to the side, um, we'll get you guys um, at least up here ready to go. But basically we have all officer positions are open, president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer, um, and four director positions are coming available, becoming available. Um, so the few we're going to hear from, I want to hear from our one of our president nominees, Tom Glukert first. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, I handed you your name tag today. If uh, you don't know me, I'm Tom Glickert. I've been working with uh, Kimley Horn for, I want to say about four years now. Uh, moved down from the great state of Illinois. I've been heavily involved in ITS Georgia the past three years. Uh, in 2019, I acted as a membership chair. Uh, the past two years, I've been acting as a treasurer. Um, as Winter alluded, I am running for the president this year. Uh, really quick, I, I have four five primary goals uh, for my presidency if I am elected. Uh, one is to increase our young member participation at all of our events and all in a, within all facets. Uh, two is to increase our or uh, re-strengthen our relationship with local agencies. Uh, number three is to re-examine our annual meeting to make sure we're providing exceptional value for, for all uh, participants. Uh, number four is to maintain and grow our outreach program, uh, which we've been really just established in the past two years. And then uh, number five is just to implement a strategic planning uh, for ITS Georgia with a two-year horizon to make sure we remain an uh, incredibly strong organization uh, in the state. So thank you for your consideration. All right. Thanks, Tom. All right. Next, um, one of our secretary nominees, Stephen Foy. Hello, I'm Stephen Foy, not to be confused with uh, John Foy, the strong arm. But anyways, uh, I'd like to say I think I am a strong candidate. I know a lot of you guys. I've been, you know, kind of in this field since the late 90s. Um, for those of you that have not voted, just uh, when you go to that virtual ballot box, just think Foy 2021. Um, thank you. Awesome. Thanks. All right, Mary, let's start with the with you this, this is for our board position um, so board of directors position there's four positions opening up thanks everyone um, most of you already know me but for those of you who don't I'm Mary Thamati I'm running for a board position um, I've been involved with ITS Georgia 
for several years, I think 2016, and I've been involved in ITS in general in the state since 2012. Um, I've worked on the membership committee. I've worked on the social committee. Um, I've been, you know, gone to conferences. I've gone to a lot of meetings. Just been really involved, and I want to bring some of those thoughts and experience to what we bring in the board. Um, I've worked with a lot of you within. Uh, worked at the Transportation Management Center, worked in Signals, worked in a lot of different places. And I think that one of the other things that I did want to mention is I, I work for Southeastern Engineering, which is a small business. It's a DBE. And one of the things with ITS Georgia is that we are all member organizations, you know. And I think a big part of showing the board is having representation from a lot of different types of members. Um, and I think that I can kind of really speak to kind of the small business aspect and subconsultants and working with vendors and working with agencies and that experience. So uh, if you guys haven't voted yet or if you don't know who your voting member is, please find out and give me your vote. Thanks. I'm trying to figure out if it's good or bad that folks have already voted yet. <laughs> um, but I guess, uh, hello everyone, my name is Mike Ruel. Uh I work with Tom and actually followed Tom down from Illinois. But I've been with Kimmy Horn now for 20 years and have spent time in a lot of different uh, Kimmy Horn offices, um, and specifically Colorado, Texas, uh, Wisconsin, Illinois, and I moved to Atlanta last year in January. And the reason I bring all that up is, is really because it's given me the opportunity to um, get engaged with a lot of different ITS chapters across the country. Um, and I, I, I'm not just saying this, and I guess I have a limited sample size, but I really think the ITS Georgia group is one of the better chapters uh, across the country. Um, and the only one I think that is close really is ITS Heartland. They've got a really good group of uh, very engaged and active professionals. But what I really think sets this uh, organization apart is the number and quality of events that uh, y'all put on and I I really appreciate it um, and I really look forward to getting more engaged with the community now that one I'm here and things are starting to open up a little bit um, but I guess thank you very much for your consideration and look forward to regardless of whether or not uh, I'm elected I look forward to really engaging with the organization and the ITS community here in Georgia. Thanks Mike for that nice All right David let's hear from you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm David St. John. I'm with uh, Digital Traffic Systems. I'm their vice president. I've been here in Georgia since uh, January. Been attending uh, meetings here since uh, 2019. And I do work on the ITS maintenance project as their program manager. And I would like to, to have your vote to be on the board of directors. I'd like to support you. I have a civil engineering background and have worked both in the heavy construction in ITS environment, particularly ITS for the past 11 years. So, looking forward to having you vote. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Hey there, my name is Arno Huguet. Um, you know, I could go on saying I graduated from Georgia Tech, I worked from uh, for GDOT for a couple of years, I worked for the railroad for a couple of years, and now I work for AECOM, but, you know, it's been a really long ride, and I've really enjoyed being here in the state of Georgia and helping out with anything ITS and signal related, and I just look for the next step, and I think being part of this organization would be a, a great thing, uh, and I just want to be part of it and do anything I can to help, so please vote for me, Arno Huguet. Uh, looking forward to, to a couple more years. <laughs> Thank you. Again, just let me know if you need any help with the voting situation and stuff, and we'll be here to help for, help you. Again, thank you all who are in person for being here at City Springs, and for those on the virtual, um, thanks for still participating with that. You can't see, but we do have quite a number of people in this room, which is, which is nice. This has um, been our, this is, like I said, our third in over a year, and this is our largest so far. So, um, and you know. Definitely, y'all, I hope you guys are all staying safe and well and keeping your family safe and well. Before we get, begin the technical side of the program, I want to present this month's sponsor. As you know, we can't keep these monthly meetings or our organization goals continuing forward as we have been without our sponsors. So, big thank you to Mike Clance with QFree for your continued support with ITS Georgia. So, come on up. I think most people know 
Mike and what he does. And I don't know if Whitney's on virtual. She was at the board meeting virtually, but I um, just want to thank them. So let's let give a round of applause for Mike. Guys. All right. Thanks, Winter. Um, as, as Winter said, I'm, I'm Mike Clance from Q Free. Uh, you may not recognize the Q Free name. You might recognize, hopefully, recognize the Intellite uh, name. So we've we've been active here in Georgia uh, for the last six years, supplying signal hardware, software, uh, central software. Intellite is now a brand of Q Free. So hopefully, you'll see the Q Free name, uh, Q Free America, specifically more and more. Uh, we're happy to sponsor this. Happy to be back in person and. Uh, I had a presentation I thought about giving, but I know you guys aren't here to listen to me. You want to hear this this panel, uh, so that's that's it. I just want to say welcome, and uh, I hope uh, you you enjoy the technical session. Awesome. Thanks, Thank Winnie. Thank you, Mike. Thanks again, Mike, for your support. All right, now let us prepare to hear about the Midtown CVTSP project with the help from our pre presenter Shelby, Ashlyn, and David. Um, if you guys, y'all could. I don't know, I'll, let, I'll introduce you, but before we pass that torch, I'm going to give a brief introduction to our moderator, and he's also one of our panelists. Alan Davis currently serves as Assistant State Traffic Engineer with the Georgia Department of Transportation and oversees the SIGOPS Traffic, traffic Signal Operations and Maintenance Program for the department. Alan also leads the department's efforts in connected vehicle deployments and applications. Alan is a registered professional engineer in the state of Georgia and South Carolina, and a professional traffic operations engineer. He serves as a member of the Signals Technical Committee with the National Committee on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And in 2006, he's a 2006 graduate of the University of South Carolina with a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering. And with that, Alan, the floor is, is yours. Come on up and introduce your group. All right, give him a round of applause, folks. Thanks. Is this the uh, microphone we need to pass? This guy. There we go. All right. And uh, I guess we need to plug this in too, don't we? Look at that. Great. Thank you all for having us out here to talk today. I have brought a few friends uh, that make this project a success, so I'm going to introduce them all up. If you all want to go ahead and come on up uh, whenever. Uh, Shelby Barron is a project manager for this, the State of Georgia's Mobility Authorities and is organizing the Atlanta Region Transit Link's efforts related to transit signal priority for Express. <coughs> Shelby graduated in 2015 from the University of Georgia with a Master of Public Administration. David Kraft is a transportation engineer at Kimley Horn in Midtown Atlanta with a focus in traffic operations and data analytics. As part of GDOT's SIGOPS program, GDOT focuses his efforts in Zone 7, which includes the urban areas of downtown and Midtown Atlanta. He has a passion for balancing operations for all modes and users, particularly in consideration for transit pedestrians. David is a graduate of the Louisiana State University and North Carolina State University and is a registered professional engineer in the states of Georgia and Louisiana and a certified uh, PTOE. Purser Sturgeon is the Connected Vehicle Program Manager for Southwest Research Institute. He has been designing, developing, and integrating CV applications and systems for over 16 years. His expertise has been focused on getting CV systems deployed in operational production environments and bridging the gap from CV to ATMS, but also to automated vehicles. And lastly, Ashlyn Morgan is a Project Manager with Atkins. She is a graduate of Auburn University and has been living and working in Atlanta for 15 years and is a registered PE and PTOE. Ashland lives in Forsyth County, Georgia, with her husband and two kids. So thank you all for joining me today. Um, this is really the team that made things work. Did all the hard stuff. I just kind of basked in the success and glory. So we'll talk through a few questions here, but I want to go ahead and sit down. Um, just give a quick overview of what this project was, what it was piloting, how it did it, um, and then we'll jump into a few um, questions that we've, we've put together to really talk through some of the what this accomplished and what we learned from it as well. Just to start things off though, I want to give a framework of where Georgia and GDOT specifically is in the connected vehicle space. Uh, we have um, over 700 roadside units deployed across the state right now that are operational uh, with several more planned. And so we have GDOT's efforts in deploying largely in Metro Atlanta, but also on in Western Georgia on I-85 on the Ray, and then also uh, down in Savannah near the ports. 
We also have partnerships with the Atlanta Regional Commission and local governments who are actually deploying this infrastructure as well that really create this uh, interesting and unique regional and statewide framework of connectivity at, at signalized intersections. And we're excited for all the partnerships and uh, things we're working through with this and the collaboration that's happening in this space uh, through public-private research and uh, all kinds of institutions. And it's been a, a, a great success for us so far, and we're excited to see where this technology and this trends take us uh, even further into private vehicles. For this project, though, what we're going to talk about. Yeah. So for this particular project, um, it focused on really 27 intersections that we had deployed in Midtown Atlanta and 10 onboard units that we put on express buses. That's the, the real beef of it and what we were trying to do. And looking at a particular route, um, is that good? All right. I'll start over from the beginning with the bios. Is that <laughs> Um, looking at this particular route in Midtown Atlanta, because it was one of the more challenging routes for Express, and we'll get into a little more about that and why, and what that looked like, and why this route in, in general. But you know, it was a, it was kind of a, if this is going to work here, then it's probably something that could work um, in multiple locations and, and, and everywhere. So this is something that we started to target to have deployed back in March 2020. It was actually deployed in March 2021. Uh, for a number of reasons, one big one, um, and really we ha we had pieces of it going, and we'll we'll talk more about that and what it looked like. Um, but we were able to make some things happen and do some creative demonstrations throughout the process to really get it going. But to to get the final product going, it took um, having our our team on the ground to really dive into it and and, and connect the pieces to make it work. So I'll go ahead and, and start our our questions here and and ask Shelby. Why did you guys agree to do this with us? What was in it for you? And, and tell me a little about your, your thoughts behind why transit signal priority and why this route. So um, Express, just to kind of give you guys a little bit of an overview of um, our bus service in general. So Express is a regional transit um, provider. We provide commuter bus service to and from um, major employment centers in Metro Atlanta. We have 27 routes that cover 12 different counties. Um, whenever we are we, whenever we are trying to travel at our peak times, because most of our service is, um, you know, during our peak commuter hours, we have uh, significant issues in some of these major employment centers. So we're talking downtown, midtown, um, trying to get buses to and from on schedule and um, you know providing reliable customer service to our um, travelers so uh, whenever we were first um, choosing routes and such we took a look at what routes do we think would be most uh, positively affected by this kind of technology and so uh, we chose to do route 431 it's our stock bridge route um, and we chose it because it goes through a particularly difficult corridor downtown and midtown, uh, West Peachtree Street, Spring Street. Um, a lot of our buses have to travel through the same traffic pattern, and so we thought it would be a good demonstration on how it could potentially even affect our uh, our other other uh, routes and services. So. When we were looking at what we were hoping to get out of this, um, like I said, reliability, schedule adherence are all issues that we experience. And um, we were really hoping that the pilot would be able to show us if traffic signal priority is a um, solution that can provide a measurable impact to um, providing on time performance um, to our service. So. One of the early things I learned is uh, early is not good in transit. <laughs> on time is good. Uh, so uh, that was a, a learning experience for me. David, 
we just heard this is one of their more challenging corridors. Signal operations in Midtown are not easy. There's a lot going on. What were some of your um, challenges to this? How did you approach it? Um, what were your thoughts behind implementing TSP in Midtown? to skip phases. We didn't want to skip pedestrian phases specifically. Um, we wanted to keep our head-friendly timing. Um, so we wanted to, we have a lot of half cycles in that area. Um, so we wanted to keep those half cycles. We could have full, full cycle those cycles and then had more time to give, uh, you know, in terms of priority time. Um, but we didn't want to do that because we wanted to keep things multi-motor friendly. Um, and then also there's a, a safety uh, impact to consider as well. Um, one of our big concerns in, in Midtown and Downtown is keeping speeds low. So we want to give extra timing to kind of open those vans up for the buses to not have to stop at intersections, but we don't want to do it in a way that it encourages not only their progression but other vehicles to the negative impact of pedestrians where we have vehicles that are now able to speed along the corridors, we have you know these open green vans. Um, so the main thing was just you know, keeping the, the multimodal perspective, um, you know, and so we looked at things like, um, you know, we have uh, active and passive signal priority along there, so we have, um, like, progression along those corridors. Um, it's specifically designed for slower speeds, so that should be conducive to transit vehicles. Um, we had um, uh, intersections that were going to be downstream um, of the bus stops, so near side stops. Um, where we made sure that we had kind of considered what the potential dwell time would be, things like that. Um, and so, yeah, just in general multimodal progression, I guess, to wrap it up, I could kind of talk about it forever, about the general strategies and the thoughts we had, so. Can you talk a little bit of detail about um, what it meant to implement TSP, what, what that looks like, what it is, the early green, late green? Yeah, sure. So, um, transit signal priority, uh, and particularly particular for our um, for this uh, particular implementation was primarily about uh, green extension and early green. Um, so the green extension, you know, the, the bus is traveling down the corridor, say it's traveling down West Peach Street, and it's, you know, it passes through, say you're approaching uh, fifth, uh, 6th Street, West Peach Street at 6th, you pass 5th Street, and then there's a, um, the bus sends, you know, a call to a uh, device, a roadside unit at 6th Street, and says, hey, you know, I just passed 5th, I'm coming down the street. Um, puts in a call for TSP, um, and so if the signal is already green, and the signal says, "Okay, well, I'm about to, uh, you know, turn from green on this priority phase to red," then instead it will hold green or do a green extension for um, however much time you program. Um, so most of our, our time program it, it ranged depending on um, our our uh, vehicle demand. So we looked at. Uh, you know, our traffic volumes we had in the area and figured out how much time we could take away from the side streets without negatively impacting um, side street uh, uh, traffic. Um, so, you know, take that time, maybe it's five seconds, say, okay, I, I can extend you for five more seconds. Um, the bus progresses along West Peach Street, it gets to, to 6th Street, it passes through the intersection, maybe it only use four seconds, and, and the TSP would, would then terminate, so we're using four of the five seconds. And then the, the reverse is true of, of the... Um, you know, early green where the bus would be arriving on a, uh, a red for that phase, for that priority phase. Uh, it would terminate the uh, side street phase earlier, maybe five seconds earlier, to be able to return to green along the main line for the priority phase. And this slide here particularly shows the ranges of the, um, the potential green time gain that we found 
um, looking at those uh, the volume data that we had collected in uh, in spring of 2019, which we thought would be you know very good volume to give us a good idea of, of how much time we could uh, provide for the priority phases. Um, obviously, traffic patterns changed significantly by the time this was impacted, and I mean, theoretically, you think that we could give it more time, um, at least prior to now versus back then. Um, going forward, you know, we'll have to see how, how traffic volumes change. Um, that's you know, just another example, kind of showing the percentage increase that we could we could give to show how much we could impact it from one street to another. You can see we had some streets like like 10th Street, um, you know, West P Street at 17th, where there's really no time we could take away without negatively impacting side street uh, uh, congestion or um, or pedestrian phases. So, yeah, I'm a big fan of how you put these graphics together, and it really demonstrates where it's available, where it's not, and just the balancing act you had to go through for all the different modes that were already present in this corridor. Uh, Ashlyn and Purser, do you guys want to talk a little bit about actual architecture? What this, what did we put out there, and how did this all work on the the vehicle and to the infrastructure side? Okay, so yeah, I'll talk a little bit about the um, process of installing, and then the brains over here. We'll talk about how we made it all work. Um, so we installed Coda wireless RSUs um, on the roadside, DSRC, um, and um, you know, there's some challenges, obviously, down through downtown Atlanta, there's some low-grade projects going on, there's new striping for bicyclists and all that stuff. So we had to create map messages and then continue to update them with new striping so, you know, the actual project would work. Um, and then we had the CODA OBUs that we installed on the express buses that Alan showed earlier. Um, and, of course, nothing works straight out of the box. Um, we all know that in the field that we're in with technology. So, you know, things... These OBUs and the road zone units, they come with equipment, but, you know, well, we don't really get to use that equipment. So we get to engineer special brackets to hang them on um, the signal poles, or we get to buy specialized antennas that we have to work hand-in-hand -hand with CERTA to make sure that the, in the antennas are long enough to connect the OBUs to outside the bus. So we had to special order those once we figured out all those dimensions. Um, and so there was a lot of stuff that went on on the infrastructure side as far as just, like, the procurement of the devices and making sure that we could hang them, making sure we could plug them in through existing conduit, existing hardware. Those presented other challenges as well. Um, and then the same thing with buses. And then first we're going to talk about how we made it work. Yeah, so uh, this really builds on kind of the last year and a half, two years worth of work that we've done with Alan, just getting the foundations of the system up and running. Um, so as I should mention, you know, we have or as Alan mentioned earlier, about 700 radios deployed now throughout the state. Um, a lot of that process involved working with the, the radio manufacturers and the vendors, the software applications on them, the, uh, with Mike and the, the guys at Enlight and QFree, getting the interfaces between the radio and the signal controller, and the foundations of the controller getting information about the map of the intersection and the geometry and the topology of the intersection, where the lanes are getting that out from the roadside units to the vehicles, and then also the signal phase and the timing of those respective approaches out to the vehicles. So building on that, we turned it around. It's okay, well now we need to get data from the vehicles and the OBU side into the controller and then request priority you know, at the, the appropriate times. So again, working with, with Mike and his guys um, to get the, the software interfaces and the APIs straightened out and tested and validated so that when the buses do request priority, you know, it's in a message that makes sense, it's all standards compliant, gets into the controller, the controller recognizes it and then either grants it or denies it based on the, the logic here that, uh, that we talked about a second ago. Um, and then there was uh, obviously some, there's some technical questions and issues and stuff that we worked with CERTA on to get the radios actually installed and powered and running in the buses. I mean, the, the antennas, are you know kind of particular. I mean, they're, they're this is a GPS-centric system. Um, the communication frequency is you know susceptible to, to the line of sight issue, so placement of the antenna is is a key consideration. So we worked with CERT on making sure that the, the radios installed in the buses were in a good place. Everything is running reliably. We're getting communications good or well between the between the bus and the, uh, the roadside units. So that was a a uh, long and involved process. Super easy, right? Yes, absolutely. No issues at all. <laughs> so as far as the actual bus integration in piece, there's, you're tying into their schedule feed to a certain degree? Uh, like? 
So that was an interesting caveat, I guess, at the beginning of the pilot. Um, so sort of in the process when we started all of this of upgrading and changing their, their CAD ADL system, so their internal system that they already use to kind of manage and track bus status and the routes and whether they're late or on time and their, their schedule adherency. Um, so since they were in the process of upgrading that system, we were not able to tie the radio application logic to request priority to that interface because it wasn't implemented and existed on the, on the buses yet. So what we did was uh, Shelby and Serta gave us kind of a, a static list of files that kind of defined what all the routes and the schedules and the trips and all the stops were and what their time points were. Um, so we had to write kind of some custom application logic to kind of parse through all of that and then get the bus to automatically, or the OBU on the bus, to automatically identify which specific trip it was on on a particular route. So simply saying we're on Route 431 is enough to say, hey, I'm at this stop, am I late or not? You have to know which instance of that trip. And the same bus doesn't run the same trip schedule every single day, so it's kind of a, a guessing game. There's some, some application logic that we had to apply on there to, to try to get the bus OBU to figure out which one it's on, and then it can try to apply that when it gets into town, say, hey, am I late or am I on time? Do I need to request priority or not? So that's a great segue into some of the challenges that we had in operations of the system. So uh, early on, we wanted to really, we wanted this to be running a year sooner than we actually had it. And so <laughs> we wanted to see what we could do in the meantime to demonstrate it, the concept in general. And we had some tools and resources in place where we could essentially fake it. David, can you talk a little bit about what that process was and how we got through that early demo that we, we did for everybody uh, in the middle of a pandemic? Yeah, yeah, that was, um, that was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, it was fun, it really was. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this slide kind of summarizes uh, some of our, our challenges. Um, you know, the, the RSUs uh, weren't all installed. Some of them couldn't be installed. Um, we didn't have buses that we could use to, uh, to do a demo. Um, and we also didn't have uh, a, a lot of detection in place for, for vehicles progressing uh, along the corridor. Um, however, we had max time and max view. Um, you know, communication systems, uh, we, had, we could use peer-to-peer -peer communications between signals. Um, we could uh, observe the corridors with CCTV. Um, Microsoft Teams, uh, which I'm sure everyone's used a ton over the past couple years now, um, was a very useful tool for the demo, which I'll show in a minute. Um, we had field vehicles that we could use to represent buses instead, um, as we did test runs along the corridor. Um, and then we had a good team of smart engineers that we could, uh, could use to figure things out. Um, and so this image right here kind of, I'll, I'll talk through it and then we'll try to play the video. Um, but this gives an example of the demonstration we had done, uh, the virtual demonstration we had done when we couldn't do a field demonstration. So this was using Microsoft Teams. I was sharing my screen and so on the left side was me and Max Time manually putting in the, the calls for TSV, checking them in um, from one database to another and manually checking them out. The middle screen was Juan, was Juan Duarte was driving the corridor um, in his uh, field vehicle and he was basically representing a bus going along the corridor. So as he went along the corridor, when he would get to, you know, whatever we would say the theoretical spot would be that a check-in call should be placed, uh, I would manually place the call. And so he had his phone just sitting, you know, in his car, on his dash, sharing his video as he drove along the corridor. Um, and then we had uh, our also engineers from our Zone 17, Zone 17, you can see uh, Mary was out there in the top right corner, um, and she was sharing her screen. And so if you see on the left of her screen, the top right corner, that was the, the field vehicle going through the intersection. So you could see, you know, the field vehicle which represented the bus going through the intersection, you can see that the uh, signal head for that phase is green, and that was actually an example of green extension, because you can see that that head on the right side, which is difficult because of the pixelation, but it's, it's holding a, um, a solid don't walk. And the reason why you know that uh, green extension is occurring right there is because in Midtown and Downtown Atlanta, almost every signal is rest and walk for pedestrians, and so the uh, flash don't walk will terminate whenever the uh, yellow comes up. So this was a countdown pet head. So it would go to zero when the yellow would come up. And so since you see the solid don't walk with the green signal head, it means that the green extension is working. Um, you can actually see in the database on the left side, uh, 
It says holding for service, so priority one, holding for service for phase six, and the remaining max time. It's, it's tough to see there because it's an tenth of a second, and so it's, it's moving, but that's 3.9 seconds. Um, so that's, you know, we can assume from that that that's about four seconds. We probably gave that signal um, for uh, additional priority uh, timing for that phase. Um, so, you know, that was 3.9 seconds. The buses or the fleet vehicle, field vehicle is going through the intersection uh, on the Great Extension. Um, but yeah, that was, you know, we, we tried to figure out how we could do a, a virtual demo um, with everyone being remote, uh, everyone in their offices and, and people in the field. Um, and we were able to do it this way without anyone being around each other. And that was, I guess, in the summer? Yeah. Summer last year, yeah. I guess we did that. Um, and then I have a, a video of it on the next, I'm not sure if it'll play or not, but we can, you can test it. There should be a video control on the bottom. Um, yeah, so there it goes. So you can see this was uh, leaving West Peachtree at 5th. Um, this was a, is a bus stop location. So one's representing the bus, um, merging into traffic, uh, going along West Peachtree. You can see um, as he went through the intersection, I placed a, a check-in for West Peachtree at 6th, and then I went to the next database, and I waited for him to get closer to West Peachtree at 8th, and then I placed uh, another check-in to represent what would be the, the call for TSP, right about any second. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, really, this is really about where the bus would actually be placed in the call, right? Right. And then the top right corner, you can see the, the pet head counting down. And then it should be, it's you now it's steady, don't walk. And the green still is up. And it's going to go to yellow, and that goes to zero. Um, so yeah, so we, were, we did that, and then Juan goes to the next uh, bus stop location um, at right before the Peachtree Place. So we were able to do that for the whole corridor um, and do like a real live demo run, um, you know, which is good. You know, it's not, I guess, completely 100% accurate of, of what would happen. You know, things like, you know, I was placing the calls manually, so where exactly is that detector check-in going to be? You know, it wasn't really sure. Um, but, I mean, we still learned a lot from that. Uh, we were able to because we did several of these, of these runs prior to the demo to make sure we could do this. Um, you know, we learned, you know, saw things about, you know, how congestion uh, from, um, like, construction could impact TSP. There was, uh, I think, around West Peachtree at, um, at 17th, there was a lot of construction going on, and so that was really uh, hindering our ability to have a successful uh, ride along the corridor. I think there's some construction going on at Linden, uh, spring at Linux, I think that might have been about the time that so the parking crane garage fell. collapsed. Is this the crane that fell or the parking garage? Maybe both. <laughs> uh, and so uh, so we learned a lot of things from that. Learned a lot of things about, you know, just programming the database, um, tweaking the different parameters, like things like uh, trying to estimate dwell time or arrival time based upon where we thought the check-ins would be, um, based upon what we assumed the speed of the vehicle would be. Um, we had an issue uh, at one point where whenever we first turned on the TSP, um, some of the signals were going into flash because uh, for that version, the priority number, I think, was linked to the phase number. So we were putting, I think, priority one meant it's supposed to be phase one or something like that. Um, but then we, we talked to uh, Analyte about that. I think they gave us an updated uh, version that addressed that concern. Um, so yeah, it was, it was good. It worked. And, Successful. So. Yeah, I, I appreciate it because I was able to actually see it see it happen and see that transit priority was something that could function in Midtown. But Ashland and Purser, for CV, it wasn't so easy to do it virtually, was it? What? How did you guys overcome the challenges of remote implementation and other challenges with implementing CV for you? Okay, so I will mention, you know, David mentioned that some of the issues were not on. Well, we all know what the FCC has been up to over the past however many years. Um, and so, so some of them were on because we didn't have FCC approval, and so we had to wait for them to unfreeze licensing, which we didn't, they didn't you know, announce to anyone. Um, so we finally got them licensed on channel 180, so we could move forward, um, and then we finally got them on. So hopefully, you know, they will work like they're supposed to. But yeah, so due to COVID, travel restrictions, we weren't going anywhere, which means 
pressure can't come over here and try to test to make sure everything is working. So, you know, we did as much testing as we could um, and then fed data back to Purser, but then in the process of that, he realized, wait a minute, something is really bad with GPS downtown. I know you're all shocked. So I'll let him talk about how he fixed that issue. Yeah, so my part of it was, as I mentioned, working on the radios and getting the radios talking to each other, the OBUs talking to the RSUs. So I can set up stuff in my lab. I have controllers, I have RSUs, I have radios back in San Antonio, which is great. Um, I can do a lot of the testing in the, there, but it's, it's on a bench. It's not real world in the production environment, seeing how things are going to go. Um, and then they have the, the RSUs once the FCC stuff got all sorted, at least for the majority of the radios. Got them talking to the, the signal controller, and that's all great because they're in the same cabinet hooked up to the same uh, network. Um, but my OBUs are in San Antonio, and granted they're wireless, they don't talk to RSUs in Atlanta very easily. So we did as much testing and development stuff as we could, kind of validating on the bench and in the lab back home, and then shipped some stuff out to our counterparts at Atkins, and also set up kind of a, a laptop and some remote tools that they could run in a vehicle connected to the radio so we can kind of monitor it as they drove through. So another one of the fun, we had lots of WebExes and screen sharings where you know, I'm sitting in the lab back home and watching them drive down the, the, the corridor downtown and trying to figure out, okay, is the, I can't see the physical signals in the heads and saying, hey, are they changing, are they not changing? Um, but being able to kind of do that remotely, it was an interesting problem to solve. Let's say. Um, and then, um, what other challenges? There was, um, like you said, the, the route identification stuff was, was one issue. And then uh, sort of was updating because of stuff going on. There's less traffic. They're, they're changing their routes and stuff. So they're updating those route files. So we're reading stuff statically you know, on the buses. Um, so making sure we had up-to-date up versions of that, making sure we had stuff that was matching their new their route file formats. Um, was kind of an ongoing challenge. Um, and then we, also, we have a couple of slides maybe yep. later on some of the GPS downtown. Um, so this is one, this one's actually showing the RSU range. There's GPS. Here's one with, yeah, some of the, the GPS downtown. So the the radios that are doing the requesting of priority, they're, they're solely dependent on GPS for figuring out where they are. As you go downtown, GPS we'll say is not the best. Um, so we were logging data from the OBUs, they're transmitting positions as they're driving through downtown. We're getting logs of that, kind of evaluating you know, where they are, where are the good spots, where are the bad spots. And you can kind of see here an overlay of the, the bus data and positions as it was driving through the downtown area. Um, so there were some updates and enhancements that we had to do to the, the algorithms and the application on board to kind of update its map matching and figure out, okay, which stop am I actually at? Um, there were times where GPS was off by like an entire block. Um, I don't know if any of this data shows it. Actually, yeah, the green one here at the center. So you can kind of see where the bus is driving up through downtown here. And it's driving north on uh, Peach Street, but GPS is going all the way over and it's matching to maps and stuff over on Spring Street. So that's one of the other fun challenges uh, that we've had to, we've been, we're still working on that right now. Um, so we have most of the stops and everything are matching and then consistently uh, identifying consecutive stops, consecutive intersections that are linked to each other. Um, and then this really shows why positional correction is so essential for safety applications in this space, right? Yep. Yeah, so that's something else that we've um, we just started looking at, Alan and, and the team, um, getting RTCM, so uh, radio communication um, versions of GPS augmentation to kind of help um, offset, hopefully, some of these GPS errors and issues through downtown and some other areas. Um, that's something we just started here in the last month or two that we're kind of evaluating, getting a, a good subscription or a correction service and then formatting that data in such a way that the RSUs recognize it. They can send that over the air to the OBUs. OBUs can get it, parse it, handle it, and then hopefully get a little bit better GPS data downtown. I mean, just imagine if you had a, a vehicle with an automated system in it that mm -hmm. relied on infrastructure communications and it mm -hmm. thought you were a block over. Yep. It's not great. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we can definitely see some issues there. So that's in, in the long run, 
um, and not get off too much of a tangent, but with the, the AV and automated systems and stuff, there's definitely going to be, they're not going to be solely dependent on GPS. There's going to be, you know, visual odometry and visual localization to help identify landmarks and relative position within a lane at intersections and stuff like that. But the two really both have to, have to work together. So you want to talk a little bit about the spread of RSUs on, on this? Yeah, so this is something that we did, a uh, data collection we did here this week. Um, we're looking at the communications efficiency and range of the radios downtown in that area and in that environment. So what this is showing is each of those circles up there represents one of the RSUs at an intersection along those two routes and the range at which 95% of the data is received by the vehicle. So as the vehicle drives through, it recognizes what radio, which RSU is sending the messages. We're getting a log of that, and we're able to plot it out at Google Earth, and then we can kind of run an analysis on that and figure out well, how, how good are the RSUs communicating in that area. Now there's a few of them up here that have you know, really big circles, and we're getting several blocks of range, and there's a couple that we're barely getting a block or two. So that's uh, part of the analysis that we're starting to run right now. Very interesting. So one bus is picking up so a bunch of signals at once. Yes. Oh, yeah. Everywhere there's an overlapping circle in here, a bus is receiving the, the map and the, the signal timing data for all of those intersections that it's getting um, data from one of the RSUs. So there, were, there are certain places down there where a bus or an OBU is getting information for 10 and 12 different intersections all at the same time. So I guess this probably plays into a lot of the ways why available spectrum and bandwidth is so important for connected vehicle applications? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's been one of the SEC issues ongoing for the last several years mm -hmm. is figuring out you know, how much spectrum is needed. And if you look at it from a, a holistic perspective, oh, you know, a vehicle sending up 10 messages per second, just its basic safety message for vehicle collision and safety applications, you know, each roadside unit sending out map data at 1 hertz and SPAT at 10 hertz. You know, those numbers don't sound like a lot, but then you get into an environment like this where you have an intersection or a radio at every single intersection because it's dedicated to that signal controller and that set of data. You know, you're, it quickly compounds and you're getting you know, thousands of messages per second and the, the, the RF congestion it really just goes through the roof. So. And then you add in more vehicles and yeah. so on and so forth. Yep. I'll get off that soapbox now. <laughs> <laughs> so David, one of the strategies of your implementation here was balancing. Did you see any negative impacts to operations in through implementing this? So we haven't seen much negative impact. I mean, I've or any really. I've I've looked at it, you know, I've tried to use probe data to, to see if there's anything there, but um, I believe what there's four buses in the morning and four in the, the PM and they're spaced like 30, 40 minutes apart, something like that. Um, so generally from them going through there, implementing the TSP, um, it's, it's really not frequent enough um, to, to impact operationally. Um, and then also, like I said, with our, our timings, we, we were pretty safe with, with how we chose how much split we were going to give um, to, to the priority splits um, in order to make sure we didn't impact uh, you know, um, the side street approaches negatively. And especially since those were for uh, pre-pandemic volumes, um, it's not really surprising that, as far as we've seen, we haven't seen any issue. This is a good example um, showing the, uh, the three uh, locations along the, the bus route, that bus route 431, um, that are within our corridor, kind of. Um, going northbound from Civic Center Marta Station uh, to Art Center, um, and then turning onto 17th and going down Spring Street, uh, going to, Mil to Linden. So you can see the, the spread of the uh, of the vehicles and, and the, the frequency. Um, and then on our right hand side is just one example of um, kind of TSP in operation from a, a data perspective. So um, that's an output from MaxView uh, filtering for, for the event showing a TSP event. So that's the arrow here I have is showing a, a check in from uh, that's Monday morning at 749. Um, and then the corresponding uh, result or impact it had at least in ATSPM, you can see that there was a an increase in that uh, phase six uh, running pattern eleven um, that morning, uh, which runs from seven to nine a.m. And so you can see consistent um, whatever thirty eight seconds or whatever it is, and then an increase to forty three seconds or something like that. Um, so no minimal impact um, that we're aware of uh, that could possibly be having negatively. So um, yeah, I think it's all been good.
So. Great. So it's great for signals. What about for buses? It's kind of a mixed result so far, right? Uh, yeah, so we've been monitoring the data, like you said, we kind of went live-ish in March, April, so this year. Um, so we've been collecting data and logs and kind of evaluating the, the data flow, the consistency of it. Um, we're still working out some of the, the logistical pieces, specifically like identifying, getting the, the bus identification. So figuring out which route is the bus on and making sure that we're syncing up to the right route file, the right trip time and stuff, so that when the bus is actually late and their CAD, their new CAD ABL system is determining its late, making sure that the radio is recognizing the same thing at the same time in kind of a parallel path. Um, apart from that, looking at when the buses get into town, when the radio thinks it's late, we have seen it make up 30 seconds up to you know a minute or two minutes if it is requesting priority through there. So when the radio comes into town and it thinks, hey, look, I'm three minutes late, you know, we see it uh, do the, the sequence of priority all the way through Peachtree, and by the time it gets to the end of Peachtree and turns around and goes south on Spring, we've seen it make up up to about two or three minutes a couple of times. So there's definitely, mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's working from that perspective. So now it's just a matter of syncing up with the, the CAD ABL system, and that's requesting priority at the, only the correct times, and it's not getting ahead of schedule and stuff like that. No early buses. Right. <laughs> so uh, we just got a couple more minutes here. Real quick for everybody, do you have any mind, any next steps for something like this? Our pilot period's coming to an end, initial end. We may keep it going. Any last closing thoughts on what may be next steps in the, in the world of TSP? Um, I'm, I have it so I'm going to go first. Um, for my first, I've, I've hit it on a few times now, but getting the integration now that sort of has their new CAD ABL system in place and it's on the, the buses, they've tested it, they trusted it, it's running, everything's good. Getting the, the radio talking to the CAD ABL system so we're not having to do some magic calculations to figure out what trip we're on. Having the, the bus tell the radio, hey, hey, I'm this trip, hey, I'm late, I'm not late, whatever. And getting the trigger from that system, getting everything all synchronized, I think is a, a good next step. Um, and then also continuing the work that we mentioned a minute ago with uh, the RTCM, getting GPS corrections and better data downtown. Um, those are the, the two areas from the technical, you know, the radio side of things that, that I'm interested in continuing and, and progressing. Um, I think, you know, evaluating the priority timings again would be the, the kind of first thing I'd want to do, um, especially uh, seeing as with you know, Georgia Tech has a huge impact uh, along that area, so um, being able to see how the impact Georgia Tech works with the bus, being able to uh, reevaluate our, our volumes and our demand along those corridors, um, our capacity has changed along those corridors. You know, we have the bike lane now in spring. Um, there's a lot of construction that's been going on on West Beach Street and, and Spring Street, uh, just in constant for years, and so um, it's it's been constantly evolving, couple of corridors, um, and so we. You know, another look at it, I, I think we would probably get some different results. Um, another thing is, excuse me, um, you know, thinking about the, the issue and the concerns with some of the GPS issues, um, we have uh, at some locations where um, originally I, I think it was planned that RSUs weren't going to be at locations downstream of near side stops. Um, so originally we, we didn't plan timings for those, but we, we put them in using peer-to-peer -peer communications and, and using user logic to say, oh, if I have a, 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 a TSP check-in at a upstream signal, then tell the next downstream signal that the bus will be coming. And so for, for where we had the near side stops, we said, okay, well, what we'll do is we'll make observations of like dwell time and stuff like that and do like an estimated delay for when that TSP will be going. Um, thinking about the GPS concerns, what we could do is we could look at where there's like the worst issues and where if the, the upstream signal that's adjacent has like very good communication issues, good GPS, then we could kind of have some redundancy by using the peer-to-peer -peer communications to have the signals essentially be, um, you know, implementing TSP to each other as, as a way to potentially address some of those concerns. So those are my main thoughts. Um, I think from our perspective, basically be reiterating what they said. We're very interested to see what um, CAD ABL integration could do. Um, you know, if it could make our priority request more precise and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and I think for us too, so 
like you mentioned, we have four buses currently going down this on, on this particular route, but we have six routes that run the same corridor. So I think, um, you know, how feasible is it once we, um, you know, have six routes with four buses each? Um, what if we add more routes, you know? So uh, all that kind of stuff are um, cool things that we're excited to explore. Well, great. I think we're uh, a little slightly over our time, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up here. Thank you guys for joining me up here and talking through this. Um, hope you all enjoyed hearing about this project. If we can do questions, or if you want to go and wrap this up? Do a couple of questions. Okay. So, if there's anyone who has a couple. Anybody how other than that guy? Yeah, there's other than me. <laughs> so, there's eight, eight trips a day. How often are you actually preempting the signal or priority going into the signal for it being paid? So it depends on the day. <laughs> um, <laughs> it depends on the day. I mean, um, like, and like we talked about, we're still working a little bit on um, on getting the, the timing right and stuff. But, um, you know, I, I looked at our CAD ABL data um, for last week, and I think we had just, you know, honestly, um, about one bus late morning, and um, we do AM and PM service, so um, morning and evening service. Uh, a day, and so it. But there's one week where we had, you know, oh gosh, it was a lot. There was one week where we had like a ridiculous amount of requests in one day, and then I think yesterday we had no requests. So I think uh, it really depends. It depends on the situation and um, that kind of thing. So. It's programmed to only request when it's five minutes behind right. schedule. But the bus often thought it was behind schedule because of some back and forth yeah. feed and configure things. So, you know, last week we had, I think, 178 check ins. You can show the slide that I have that, or I think it's West Peachtree at Monday, <laughs> uh, the one that had the maps. Yeah, right? Yeah, so. that's one. And so that, that was all the calls it had, you know, over the past two weeks that I just have just going here. So from um, August 10th to yesterday, this was yesterday morning. Um, I just that, that gives you an idea, you know. Two week time period. So one signal. Yeah, for, it's the first signal on the route, so um, you know, obviously the connector congestion probably impacts the schedule of the bus a lot, so it may be a good indicator of you know, um, when it's arriving behind schedule. What was the uh, approximate range you were picking up uh, the bus from that particular signal? And I saw the different size circles um, at each intersection. Uh, can you give me a feel for maybe a low end and, and a high end? And then Follow-up question on the uh, CAD system that you're integrating. Do you envision similar GPS issues with that, or does that have a system to automatically kind of correct for some of those issues? Okay, so tackling our two range and the range. Um, so a few of these circles can look here in the middle. There's an the orange one and the purple one here. They're getting a little over about one block, so you know, a few hundred feet or so. Um, and then there's a couple of you know, really big ones that are getting probably, oh, uh, looks like about two, three, four, five, maybe six or seven blocks of range, uh, which is actually incredibly good for that, that downtown, that environment. Um, we've looked at these prior to this deployment here, a lot of the, the RCUs that we installed for Allen or have integrated and tested throughout the, the whole metro area. They're on arterials that have a lot better line of sight. They have less occlusions. There's not so much signage. There's not so much other stuff going on. And we've, we've seen up to a kilometer, two kilometers of range on some of the radios out in nice big open environments. Um, and then kind of expanding from that back in the San Antonio area where we have huge flat nothing that we can test around, we've seen up to 4 and 5K of range. Um, and that's a kind of an optimal, you know, everything's at max power and stuff there. So there are certain environments where we intentionally back off, you know, transmit power because you don't need to get information out, you know, five kilometers advance um, for all scenarios. And a lot of the, the highway applications, though, they're more like traveler information. They're less of, you know, signal timing at intersection. So there's a balancing and kind of a, a fun game you get to play there. Um, and then the other question is on CAD ABL. And GPS. And GPS. So I don't have a really great answer for you, truthfully. <laughs> um, but my instinct is that... Um, Probably not as many issues. Do you have any prediction going on in terms of GPS position or DSP in the background, or this is like within within the range? Uh, 
you know, OP is just sending a signal to RSU and then uh, you are just, you have a logic. Yeah, so that was kind of one of the, the first updates and enhancements that we made to the application on the bus. So there's there's two pieces at play. One is the, the map that the RSU is sending out to the buses, and that has like a, a linear, just a, a mapping of all the different lanes, and here's a sequence of GPS points. And that's drawn from like satellite imagery, which is relatively close, within a meter or two usually of the lanes. Uh, once the bus comes in, you know, we have full trajectory information on the bus. We know latitude, longitude, heading, and speed. So we are doing some I won't want to call it predictive, but it, it's doing some snapping to uh, adjacent lanes in the right heading. So that's part of how the bus is identifying which stop it's at, which stop it's at, which lane it's in, which approach it's in, so it knows which map to request priority to at that control at the time. Um, for the, I know you were talking a little bit about near side versus far side stops. As part of the, the future um, iterations of this, this pilot, are y'all looking at the potential of uh, relocating stops near side versus far side and what impact that would have? I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think, um, not, not immediately, um, not at this point, but I definitely think as um, it's something that would, would definitely be talked about, I think, if in a wide implementation of TSP on transit in Atlanta, so. Oh. Last one. Okay, one more. <laughs> so, what is that you explain why you have hard code schedule right now for each bus? Is the schedule comparison is on the OQ side or on the RSU side when the bus has been? So the, the schedule that we're looking at is loaded onto each of the buses on the OBUs locally. So whenever Surrey goes through and updates their routes or their trip times or something else, we have to go push a new batch of files out locally on the, onto the OBUs. In a perfect world, it connects directly to their system. Yes. Updates automatically. Yep. Okay, thank you all very much. Everybody. some reminders. Thank you, Alan, as our moderator. Thank you, panelists, so much for being here and talking to us about the Midtown CV TSP project. Real quickly, election for our officers and directors. They will close Tuesday. Also, awards are open, closing September 31st. There are six categories, so please go online, check those categories out, and please nominate people. Nominate yourself, your own organization, your own projects. 2021 annual meeting. Um, on the road again is next month in Savannah, September 19th to 21st. Uh, blocked room rate ends today, so getting those special um, room prices ends today. Registration sponsorship is open. Golf registration for Sunday is open. Keep an eye out for our ITS Georgia emails, media announcements, social media announcements to stay informed. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me specifically. Thank you again for joining us. Next month, annual meeting. October, TMC 25th anniversary. Thank you again. Bye.